Psalm 1 is the word of God. Let's read it together. We'll pray and then dive into our teaching. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. It's the word of God. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word, and we know that your, your very word, Psalm 119, says, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You've commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that our ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then we shall not be put to shame, having our eyes fixed on all your commandments. We will praise you with an upright heart when we learn your righteous rules, O oh God. We will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake us. God, we need your word. It is like life. It is like living bread. It is what we need to be sustained in a world full of darkness, sin, and the power of the evil one. We pray, God, that as we read this and teach this scripture, you would feed us, feed us spiritually. And we ask this all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to start off this morning just pointing at something that, that we all feel. And, and what I want to do is, in, in pointing to that, I want to then maybe put some words to that feeling that we have. But here's what we feel. Our, rapid, our, our culture is rapidly changing. You feel that? Our culture is rapidly changing. We, we feel that, right? Uh, one author, he, he said, there's a reason that you feel that way, because it is. Our culture is changing. He said in the United States, we're facing something rather unique where we're at in history. He said for the first time in our country's history, we've entered what he calls a post-Christian culture. Indigenous Native Americans prior to colonization, that was a pre-Christian culture. In a pre-Christian culture, people are not familiar with Christianity. They haven't heard of the Bible. They, they don't know its teachings they haven't ever laid eyes on the Bible. They don't know Jesus of Nazareth. The, the Americas prior to colonization were pre-Christian. Fascinating, by the way. Do you know what happened when uh, colonists came to the Americas? Do you know what percentage of colonists were church-going, Bible-believing Christians? I used to think it was like 95%. It was 17%. Even when Europeans came to the United States, it was, for all intents and purposes, still pre-Christian. People were unfamiliar with the Bible. They were unfamiliar with who Jesus was. And that led to a shift. You know, over time, Americas uh, and the United States of America became predominantly Christian, where church attendance was valued. The Bible was at least familiar. It was even occasionally read. And even if people didn't necessarily embrace everything by faith, people knew that Jesus was considered to be God. They knew the rudimentary teachings of the Bible. They knew the rudimentary teachings of Christianity and Christian theology. And nobody knows when the shift exactly happened, but the shift has happened, and we've entered, and we now live in a post-Christian culture. You feel that? Two examples of this. First example of a post-Christian culture, it actually is a personal example of mine. I, I went to Vanderbilt University for grad school. And during my first seminar, seminars are kind of smaller class sizes. There was about a dozen or so of us there with a teaching assistant who was leading us through material and readings. In our first meeting, 
the TA was going around and he said, let's do some introductions, get familiar with one another because we're going to be spending the semester together. I want to go around and I want you to share what's your name, where are you from, and this is in 2012, what's your name, where are you from, and what is your preferred gender pronoun? This is a Christian divinity school. And any sense of a godly view of creation, sex, gender, anthropology, it's assumed that's antiquated, that's in the rear view mirror, because Christianity, for all intents and purposes, is in the rear view mirror. We live in a post-Christian culture, you see. Second example you can point to is kind of the rise in radical fringe political groups. Especially on the conservative end of the spectrum, experts have been tracking the rise of these groups over the last several decades. And they've led to, you know, the formation of groups like the Three Percenters, the Oath Keepers, Proud Boys, Texas Freedom Forms, uh, Freedom Force, and dozens of others. Four of these radical girl groups are actually organized in Colorado, some in the Denver metro area. These are radical, racist organizations that teach that the white race is supreme and superior to all other races. What's troubling about these groups is that there's no godly, biblical view of humanity. All human beings, according to Scripture, are created in the image and likeness of God. All humans, no matter what their political affiliation, no matter what their race, their economic status, their gender, or their nationality, all human beings are worthy of dignity and respect because Christianity says that they have been indelibly marked by the creator of the universe. But if Christianity is in the rearview mirror, well, now it becomes our group needs power. Our group is going to dominate your group. Your group's what's wrong with the world. Your group needs to be destroyed. We feel these things in a rapidly changing culture. We now live in a post Christian culture. What has this new culture done to us? Well, for one, as evidenced in the examples that I just gave here, it's made us believe we can be truly happy, truly blessed, truly fulfilled, truly satisfied and content. We can be truly happy without God. Ask a person on the street, ask Anyone, and if you were to ask him the question, what will make you truly happy? It's likely you're going to get a number of responses. It could be, well, if I could just pay off my student loan debt, then I'd be happy. If I could get my kids into the right school and if they met the right spouse, that would give me peace of mind. That would give me contentment. And if I could be promoted, then I'd be satisfied. I've been in the same job for decades and I feel like I've hit a ceiling. If I could just make it to the next level, then I think if that happened, I'd be happy. If I could finally get our forever home at a low interest rate with reasonable property taxes, that would make me finally happy. If you live in Colorado, I might be the first to tell you this. I don't know if that dream is ever going to come to fulfillment for you. I know how I'd answer it. If I was you know, removing all pretension, all sense of superiority. And if I were asked, what would make you truly happy? I'd say something like, well, if my kids were top of their class, best on their teams, if I got published, if I had a book published and finally people recognized me, if my marriage flourished, if I never had to see a counselor again, if I was liked by everyone, that's something that's a very hard feat, by the way. If I had enough money for retirement, enough money for a vacation home, and enough money for a charcoal-colored 2020 Ford Ranger V8 Lariat with a manual transmission, then I'd be happy. (laughs) Then I'd be content. Those are all likely responses. They're fair and reasonable responses. There's not necessarily something wrong with those responses, but... There is one thing that's missing in all of these. None of these responses make any reference to or even seem to recognize the existence of God. Each of those answers assumes I can be happy, I can be content, I can have true blessedness without God. David was the king of Israel. He's actually believed to be the author of Psalm 1. It's believed 
that he lived in a culture that was similar to ours, a culture that was once predominantly religious. He had actually led it to that pinnacle of religiosity. Religious attendance and participation was valued. He built a temple where people could come and worship, or he had planned a temple where people could come and worship. The Bible was familiar, and it was read on a regular basis in worship services throughout the land of Israel. And people who didn't even embrace everything in the Bible, they would have at least said, I believe in God. I believe in the God that liberated our people out of Egypt long, long ago. But that culture was beginning to shift, shift away from being predominantly religious, predominantly Jewish, and shifting toward a belief that we can be happy, we can be truly happy, apart from God, without God. So David, the king of Israel, he's observing this shift, and he begins this passage writing verse 1. He writes, Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. That word blessed, it's the Hebrew word asher. It means a little bit more than how we use it today, you know, when we post something on Instagram, hashtag blessed, a little bit more than that. <laughs> it means to have true contentment, true happiness, true fulfillment and flourishing before the very God who created us and fashions our steps. David said, truly happy people, blessed people are those who do these things. That's how the psalm starts. And notice he says, Three things make the list of things that someone who is truly blessed do not do. He doesn't say, blessed is the man who does X, Y, and Z. Instead, notice there's three negatives. He does not do this. He does not do this. He does not do this. Very simple. Verse 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Very simple. Do you want a happy life? Then keep away from sin. Do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Do not stand in the way of sinners. Do not sit in the seat of scoffers. In other words, keep away from sin. Simple. But look a little deeper. Look a little bit closer. David says, notice what sin does. It's not just, hey, avoid sin. It's because of what sin actually results in, what it does, because sin builds on itself. It compounds. Notice, first, the man is walking in the counsel of the wicked. Walking in the counsel of the wicked. Walking in sin. Walking to places that God said, do not walk, because, ah, it's not a big deal. Not a big deal to walk down that path. God really doesn't even, I don't even think he really cares about some of these things that he says here. I'm just going to Take a walk and, and venture into that area. Then what happens next? The, the man finds himself standing. He, he stands in the way of sinners. Standing, fixed, looking, drawn in. Finally, by the end, the man is sitting. He, you know, he, he's firmly fixed in sin. He actually pulls up a chair and, and he sits with scoffers on this path of sin. And the next thing you know, he's firmly fixed in it. What began as a stroll, no big deal. I'm just going to take that path, walk down there. Next thing you know, you're standing, you're involved, you're looking, you're taken in. Before you know it, you're comfortable with it. You're sitting in it. It's got you in its grips. You're firmly flit fixed in sin, thinking at first it was no big deal, just a little bit stroll. Next thing you know, you're sitting. Sin compounds, it builds on itself. Rico Tice, who's a former pastor and author, he put it really well. He said, when it comes to sin, we, just, we fail to realize this fact. He said, quote, we begin by doing sin. But in the end, before we know it, sin is doing us. We start out thinking, I got control over this. I'm just going to do a little bit of it, right? I'm just going to follow the counsel of the wicked, right? Because the world says that these things aren't sin. The world says that these things are no big deal. I'm just going to take a little bit of a stroll. Next thing you know, what we began by doing all of a sudden is driving us. We can't not do it. We begin by doing sin. All of a sudden, sin 
is doing us, controlling us, firmly fixing us in its grip. Ask any man who has ever struggled with internet pornography. They'll say that's exactly what sin does. It just began walking. It's just, just a click, no big deal. I'm only going to be here for a couple seconds. Next thing you're involved, you're staring, you're fixed, you're drawn in, you're participating. Ultimately, you're, you're sitting with sin, firmly fixed in its grip. You began by doing sin. All of a sudden, sin is doing you. That's what sin does. It compounds on itself. Flip back to Genesis. Very opening pages of the Bible, God made everything good. He made a world without sin, a world without death. He made a, a world of life. But it was just one sin. Adam and Eve, one, one sin. Following the counsel of the wicked Eve, walking in the counsel of the serpent Satan, tempting her to believe, you can be happy without God. You can find true contentment, true fulfillment. Actually, you would be better off without God. You, you can be happy apart from the God who created you. And, and what do you know? Her walking led to standing, led to sitting. Now our world is compounded with sin, firmly fixed in the grips of evil, death, and destruction. That's why in our culture, a culture like David's that says we can be truly happy Fulfilled without God. That's why in our culture over the last two decades, researchers have seen a spike in what they call psychological distress outcomes. A spike in depression, anxiety, rates of hopelessness and loneliness, reported low numbers of life satisfaction and sense of purpose in life. Why? Because like Adam and Eve... We believe the lie that you can really be happy without God. And because of that, our world is compounded with sin, firmly fixed in the grips of evil, death, and destruction. We think we have happiness, but we're lonely, we're depressed, we're anxious, and we're purposeless as a culture because we believe the lie. You can be happy without God. David begins, the truly blessed man, do you want to be happy? Well, the truly blessed man knows what sin does, knows how sin seeks to dominate you and firmly fix you in its grips. The truly blessed man walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Three negatives. David continues, verse 2, to a positive. He says, but... His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. The truly happy person delights in God's law, his, his words, delights in God's scriptures, God's instructions, God's teachings, God's message, God's precepts. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord and he meditates on it. He ruminates on it. He seeks to apply it in his day-to-day -day life, meditating on it day and night, night and day. Sometimes people will say things like, you know, I don't, I don't want a religion. I don't want a religion. I don't want rules and laws and statements of belief and doctrine and commandments. I just want a relationship with Jesus, a relationship with God. Sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Except for those of you who are married, have you ever tried to have a relationship without any rules? Do whatever you want, spend your money however you want, never ask your spouse what they want out of the relationship or for the relationship, sleep with whoever you want. A relationship without law, without limits, without boundaries is no relationship at all, at least not a meaningful one, right? When it comes to the blessed man, he wants to know God's law. He wants to hear God's instruction. He wants to embed the commandments of God in his mind as a means of relationship with God because he knows there is no life apart from this God and what he has revealed to us in his word. There's no life apart from this God and what this God says. This God's word is like bread given to feed us spiritually. That's why Jesus said, when being tempted by sin, nonetheless, 
Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The blessed man realized, I, I need this. This is, this is fundamental to my existence. He realized David at bottom, verses 1 and 2, how this psalm begins. Fundamentally, he's saying there is a, a cleavage, right? There is a break. There is two different ways of living, two different ways of life. One way of life says, I don't need God's law. I don't need his scriptures. I don't need his truth. In fact, I kind of think the Bible is a little bit backwards. I, I actually think it's probably just a collection of writings, people's spiritual experiences that they put down at one time. It seems a little bit outdated. It doesn't really speak to my life here and now. At the end of the day, I don't, I don't really need God to instruct me. I don't really need him to speak into my life. At the end of the day, I can be happy without this God. I know what's best for my life. I don't need God directing me. That's one way. The other way of life says, no, I, I need to know God's law. I, I need it like I need bread every morning. I, I need his truth. I need to hear from God. I need God's instruction because my life cannot work apart from God's guidance. If I'm going to be happy, if I'm going to be truly content and fulfilled, I need God to instruct me. I've been down this path, and every time I did go down this path, I got burned. I need God to lead me now. I need him to speak into my life. I need his word to guide me in every single circumstance in my life because it is like bread for my soul. Our shifting culture, it doesn't, it doesn't like this, this dichotomy. It's too, it's too objective. Two paths, that's it. One right, one wrong. We, we think all paths lead to God. There are multiple valid good ways to live and it's not our place to say which one's right and, and which one's wrong. But friends, that's simply evidence that we have entered a post-Christian culture. That way of thinking is simply evidence that we have entered a post-Christian mode of existence. Think about it. Somebody comes to you and they say, I know how you drive a car. I think there are multiple valid ways to drive a car though. That gas pedal, I prefer to think that that's more like a brake, especially in park. How will that go? Or they say, I've heard that people, you know, across the Atlantic Ocean, they actually drive on the left side of the road. I'm going to try that here because, you know, there's, there's multiple different ways to interpret how to drive a car. How good is that going to be, driving on the left side of the road? Or what if you saw somebody doing math and... You overheard somebody come up to them and say, did you not know there are actually multiple valid ways of doing math? Addition, subtraction, you have no idea. You can actually subtract for addition and you can, uh, you can add for subtraction. You can just swap them. Chemistry, oh, there are multiple valid ways of doing chemistry. I bet you never knew that. Fortunately, we haven't entered a post-math culture. <laughs> But why do we think, okay, there's one way to drive a car. There's one way to do math. There's one way to do science and chemistry. But God, there are multiple ways. You just follow any path that you choose long enough, and it'll ultimately lead to God. How wrong-headed that is. And it's just evidence we are in a post-Christian Culture, fundamentally, according to David, there are two ways, only two ways. Either I got this, God, I can lead myself, I can be truly happy without you, or God, I need you to lead me. My delight is in the law of the Lord. There, there's no happiness apart from life and the law and the instruction of you, God. There's no happiness apart from this word, your guidance, you telling me where to go in your scriptures because at the end of the day, there is only one way to life that is right and there's only one way to true happiness and it is here in God speaking to us, his people. It really does beg the question too. Do you delight in the law of the Lord? Do you read it? 
Do you think that it's precious? Do you, do you think of this as bread for your soul? You don't have to be a Bible scholar. Nobody's saying that. You don't have to be a theologian. Nobody's saying that. You don't even have to read the Bible every minute of every day, but you do have to know it. You do have to treasure it and delight in it. You have to delight in it when it's read, when it's taught. You have to live by it. You have to have faith in what it teaches in every part. Because apart from this word, there's, there's no such thing as true happiness. Because apart from this word, you do not have a relationship with the living God. You don't. I want you to imagine, say, social media post, boom, blast it out there. It's on the Instagrams and the TikToks. I know that's not how you say it. <laughs> but it says, Jesus is coming back one night only. He's returning, coming to Ball Arena. He's going to speak. One night only, free admission, open bar or cafe or whatever, free concessions. Jesus is going to cover the tab because he's going to come speaking. He's going to answer your questions. He's going to guide you. He's actually going to sit down with you and instruct you on what is really important in life. He's going to shift your priorities. He's going to orient you toward himself. He's going to speak to you personally. I'd imagine if that happened, no matter what your religious or spiritual background, you would make time to go hear Jesus. You'd clear your calendar. You'd make your appointment. You'd cancel an appointment. You'd make time to go hear Jesus, God speaking to you. Friends, do you realize that is what we have here? The teaching and instruction, law, commandments, the very word of God himself speaking to us, giving us guidance, instructing us on what's important in life. Do you delight in the law of the Lord? Apart from this word, there's no such thing as true happiness. There are two ways of life. One that leads to death and destruction and the other that leads to delight in God and true blessedness led by him. David goes further in describing these two ways of life. Look at verse 3. He uses these two powerful contrasting images. Speaking first of the blessed man, David says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water and yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The blessed man who delights in God's word, he's like a tree. He's firmly planted by streams of living water, no less. His leaf doesn't wither at the change of seasons even. He bears fruit. He has true spiritual prosperity and fulfillment and life in God. Verse 4, the wicked are not so. What are they like? They're like chaff that the wind drives away. You almost can't think of two more contrasting images here. The tree, when the wind comes against it, it doesn't topple. Its roots are deep. Its trunk is strong. It's not going to topple. We had winds last night, you know, 60 miles an hour. And we have a tree that's hanging over our house kind of like this. Still didn't fall secure. The chaff, what is that? You, the chaff means the leftovers. That's what the chaff is. When uh, in the ancient world you'd harvest wheat or barley or some sort of grain, we'll just say it's wheat, you'd put it into a winnowing basket. And what you would do is you would take all of this harvest of wheat and you'd start to sift it like this. And what would happen is the seeds, which were the most heavy of all the contents of the wheat, they would fall down to the bottom because they're the heaviest. And then you toss into the air the remaining chaff and the remaining grain. And what would happen is there was just a little bead of wind. The chaff, the outer membrane of the grain, it would just go with the wind. Dust in the wind. Insert Kansas joke here. <laughs> and so you'd, you'd be left with the seed, which you wanted, the grain which you wanted, which would actually fall to the ground in front of you, but the chaff, whew, here one minute, gone the next. The blessed man who delights in God's word, he's like a tree 
firmly rooted. The sinner who believes, I can be happy without God, chaff. You remember the Oklahoma City bombing? Timothy McVeigh planted a 4,000 pound bomb in a federal building in Oklahoma City. I went back and looked at pictures last night. Nine story building. The front half of the building was complete rubble. It had been gutted. Nothing was recognizable. Each story destroyed top to bottom, every single one. Cars that were parked near the building in the adjacent parking lot, they were black because of the heat of this 4,000 pound bomb. They're unrecognizable, charred and left in ash. But then in the middle of this parking lot, was one tree in the middle of the parking lot surrounded by pavement and asphalt it had been there since 1920 after the bombing the tree was touched for sure some of the limbs fell off leaves were scattered but there it was boom firmly rooted in the ground, never to topple, not even when a 4,000 pound bomb that destroyed the work of man hit it. Would it ever topple? It was left intact. The person who delights in God's law is directed by God's law. His instruction, his ways are like this tree. Compare that to the chaff. The man who walks in the counsel of the wind of the wicked, the wind, the slightest breeze comes. <sighs> Gone. Dispersed, blown away, forgotten, destroyed. History, you realize, it's marked with this mentality. Since Adam and Eve, to David, to Jesus, up to today, it's marked with this mentality that says, I can be happy without God. I don't need God in my life. I can lead myself, God. I can just live life fine without you. I can live my life without reference to you, your law, your scriptures, your word, your instruction. And because of that, life becomes a pursuit of everything that this world has to offer. Stable career, financial security, sexual fulfillment, positions of power, nice car, killer wardrobe, beauty and fashion. And then one day, all of those things, (sighs) gone. It's like the dust when you open up When you open up your blinds in the morning, you see it in the morning light. You see a speck of dust one second and then gone the next. Nothing's left. Anybody here recognize the name Julie London? One, two, three, four, five. (laughs) Five people. If I would have asked you that in 1950, that would have been like saying, who here knows Taylor Swift? (laughs) Internationally known, internationally celebrated. And isn't it interesting? Here we are 75 years later, five people have heard of her. She was famous, high profile, recognized. She had everything that this world has to offer, but like chaff, the fame, the recognition, the celebrity, blown away. Just as the scriptures say, right after Adam and Eve sin, you know what God says to Adam and Eve? Apart from me, you are like dust, and to dust you shall return. Two ways of life. The tree, the blessed man who delights in the law of the Lord, and the chaff, the one who walks in the counsel of the wicked, taken in by sin, is here today, gone tomorrow, blown away, dispersed, forgotten, destroyed. And don't be fooled. Only one of these ways leads to true happiness. Only one. We wouldn't be reading David fairly or correctly if we just thought this passage was pertaining to this life, the 72 and a half years that we've been given existence on average. No, David is speaking about what is past this life, eternal life, eternal blessedness. Look at verse five. Verse five, David says, therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, 
nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You see what David is saying? He's saying that the wicked who stand with sinners in this life will not stand in the judgment to come. The sinners who in verse 1 thought, I don't need God. Those who stand in the way of sinners when it comes to the point where you really need to stand before the judgment of seat of God, they won't be able to stand. They will be toppled like chaff. They will be driven away, destroyed, judged guilty eternally. Those who sat with scoffers, you know what a scoffer is, right? A person who mocks, a person who sits above and says, oh, I see all that silliness that you believe down there. Can you believe what those Christians think? Can you believe what those Christians think about Jesus, what they, what they believe? They, they, they teach that out of the Bible. The scoffers sitting in judgment over others, when it comes to the point of judgment, they will not sit in the congregation of the righteous. David is saying there's a deliberate choice. Two ways. Stand with sinners now in our changing and shifting culture, here today, gone tomorrow, or stand in the judgment that's to come. There's only one way that you can go. Sit with scoffers now or sit in the congregation of the righteous eternally when Jesus returns to judge the living and the dead. This is the choice. We're all going to stand. We're all going to sit. Will it be now seeking your own happiness apart from God now or will it be later when God returns in judgment? Friends, you're an eternal creature. You were made to live eternally. You will live beyond this life, proven by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That's why the author of Hebrews pleads with his audience. The author of Hebrews, like David, made it clear. He said, it's appointed for man to die once and then the judgment. Your finite life will end and it will give way to eternal everlasting life either with God or away from God. Fundamentally, at bottom, there are two paths, like a tree. One leads to eternal life and true happiness. The other, like chaff, will lead to eternal destruction and judgment. Another way of saying this is if you want to live life apart from God now, then on the day of judgment, that's exactly what you will receive eternally. That's what it means in verse 6. Look again at verse 6. To perish eternally. The way of the wicked will perish. Future tense. But the Lord knows the way of the righteous. This is what's fantastic. This is what's Utterly mind-blowing here. The Lord knows the way of the righteous because, of course, in the psalmist, David, he had no way of knowing this in full. But when he presents us with these two ways, what David is saying is it's not just a choice of us standing here and either we obey and get our act together or we don't and we're separated from God. No, he said there is a man who is a better Adam, who's a better you, who's a better me who was God himself who became a man. He is the truly blessed man, the man who perfectly walked in righteousness every day of his life from birth to death, and his name is Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect, spotless, sinless, holy life before God, never walking in the way and the counsel of the wicked, never standing in the way of sinners, never sitting in the seat of scoffers, but instead his delight day in and day out, his daily bread was the word of God, the law of God, perfectly fulfilled in your place. And the great twist, the great irony, and the great tragedy of the Bible also says that that man who walked perfectly in the counsel of God also bore the eternal wrath and judgment that we deserve for walking in ways opposed to him. If that's not good news to you, then friends, I have no other way to give you good news. 
Jesus is the blessed man, and through faith in him, we will either receive his righteousness, receive his perfection, receive his obedience and his punishment in our place, or God will allow us to walk condemned in the way and the counsel of the wicked.